Yeah, welcome back to Monday Morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. Uh, and, you know, if you, if you hadn't noticed, leadership has become very important in our time, in the time of COVID. Uh, and the Bar Association and the lawyers who practice law and who will help us knit the rabbled sleeve of COVID, they become very important. Uh, they become important also uh, to save our democracy. And the Hawaii State Bar Association is busy in that regard. And a former president, Craig Wagnall, and a director of Think Tech, actually, um, and a person who has appeared on a number of occasions on our shows, joins us now uh, to discuss a program that he, uh, he was involved in founding and he, he, uh, he shepherds through year after year. Um, that is the Leadership Institute at the Bar Association. Welcome to the show, Craig Wagner. Well, oh, thanks, Jay. Nice to be here. Let's talk about the program. What is it intended to do? I mean, if it was intended merely to develop leaders in the state, in the, among the lawyers, um, that was a great idea 12 years ago. But actually, it has become even a more important idea today. But tell us about the history of this institute. Well, sure. I, you know, the founding or the start of the Institute was um, part of a strategic planning uh, meeting that took place, uh, I want to say, 12, 13 years ago. Um, you know, Jeff Seal was president of the bar at the time and had set up a strategic planning uh, meeting among uh, many of the, the different uh, groups in the bar and the bar association uh, uh, its leadership, and, and they were looking at what are the areas that uh, the board of directors and, and the bar association in, 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 as a whole can do, uh, what are the areas that we need to improve on, and where, how can we do that, and one of the things that uh, came out of that uh, was the idea of developing a leadership institute and giving uh, con essentially continuing education to our, um, you know, our younger members of the bar who've come out of a legal education and started into a legal practice, but you know, our need, you know, as all of us do, you know, it needs some help and, and, and direction. And how do I start to focus my energies uh, to assisting the bar as a whole, our community as a whole, and um, and and see beyond just our our law, you know, the the, the small area perhaps of practice. Uh, that we're doing. And I think that, um, you know, that's where it started. And that was the discussion. And then that went to a committee. And then I had the, the pleasure of serving on that committee, which was the committee, you know, that was organized to design a program and, uh, and plan for implementing a leadership institute. Um, and so I think this is our 11th year uh, doing the leadership institute. Uh, there's been changes along the way, and as, as we've seen things that have worked well, things that haven't. Um, but I've been involved both in the planning and the, in the selection process for our Leadership Institute fellows each year, and, uh, and also in uh, helping to put on you know, one or more of the programs. And, and one that we've done a number of years uh, that I've done with uh, Lynn Flanagan, uh, our former executive director there, is that community leadership program that, uh, you, that you moderated uh, just this past Friday. Yeah, I, going back, uh, it strikes me that uh, lawyers can find their own way, can't they? They're smart. They went to law school. They, they passed the exam. They passed the bar exam. Um, they're naturals for um, you know, elected office. They're naturals, obviously, for judge jobs. Uh, why do you need a leadership institute? I mean, uh, don't, don't they already know? Can't they find their own way? Don't they understand the nature of our institutions and our community well enough to develop leadership on their own? Well, I, mean, I, I think, first of all, that's, you know, you're making a lot of assumptions um, about lawyers in, in general. Um, and I think that, that there are attorneys that don't need the Leadership Institute, that uh, have natural leadership skills, perhaps, or, or have done uh, many, uh, have, are already involved in leadership going through law school and even before that, and then, and then moving on. But there is a large segment of uh, our, you know, the attorneys in, in Hawaii that come out of law school and start into the, the profession. They're working in a firm or they're working uh, uh, in an organization and such, 
and they're concentrating very hard on their profession. They're concentrating on becoming good practitioners and, and learning how um, the law works and how their job will work. Uh, what they're unable to see is, you know, how do, can I contribute outside of, uh, of the particular area of the profession that they're in? And the Leadership Institute was designed to allow not only, uh, you know, training and such in terms of uh, the profession and, and uh, I mean, in terms of leadership in general and to see how others have been involved in leadership, uh, but also to give an opportunity for them to give back and be involved. So our Leadership Institute fellows, when they finish the program, have already signed on as a part of a, accepting the participation to the following year, uh, participating in some kind of leadership role, whether it's within the Bar Association or even something outside of the Bar Association, but something that's helping the community. You know, I was uh, when I went to law school at uh, NYU. It was uh, back in the uh, oh God, I can hardly remember. Uh, back in the '60s, uh, I know that's hard to believe. Um, they had <laughs> a guy named Peter Fry. He was our professor, and he said, "You guys are not getting enough New York civil civil practice, the kind of thing you really need on the ground." Um, and he developed a course about New York civil practice. It was the the rules of court and so forth uh, in New York State. Now, what, I, what I think is interesting is that the law schools, uh, although they you know, they teach a lot of um, you know uh, activist type issues and uh, they try to make rounded rounded citizens out of their out of their students, uh, query: Do they talk leadership? Do they have a course in leadership? Do they have a course in community service? Now, uh, either uh, you know instead of or in addition to. Uh, the Leadership Institute and the Bar Association, which I personally think is, is a critical program. Don't you think it would be helpful if the law school uh, taught leadership? I mean, a serious course in leadership, a three-point course in leadership, um, plus maybe community service, how to handle um, you know, the obligation of the, of the licensed lawyer to help the community, to serve on boards, to develop uh, community organizations. Uh, don't you think that would be good in law school? Oh, I do. I, I, I think there are a number of courses that would be good to have in law school that unfortunately they don't include. And, and I think part of that run creates the frustration for many of us who came out, uh, out of law school and realized that while I've had a great education in terms of the law and specific, uh, the substantive law and even procedural law, you know, how to practice, uh, how to work with clients, how to work with people, how to become leaders. I mean, all of these things are not taught, uh, you know, as a, as a course in law school. And, and I think some law schools have started moving more towards trial practice and other, uh, uh, having courses like that. And that's, that I think is very valuable. Uh, but most people come out of law school realizing I know uh, about some things about the law. I don't know how to practice law and how to, how to even do that. Um, so I think including courses, you know, in leadership and such as well would be really helpful. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people would find those useful, not just in terms of what they do as their profession, um, but what you do for the profession and what you do for the community. Because as, particularly as lawyers, I think we have not just, uh, um, you know, an, an opportunity to help the community, but we have a duty to do that. Yeah. Okay, well, let's let's talk about uh, you know what the program is like. I enter the program. Uh, what am I expected to do? What am I expected to learn? Uh, what, what kind of uh, what kind of um, you know uh, events are included? What kind of lessons uh, are provided? Well, I will start with uh, you know the obvious that that this is a unique year, and so a number of the more social type events. Uh, the, the get-togethers, the opportunity to do the face-to-face -face type of things. Uh, right now, uh, we're in a flux. We're trying to work out as much as we can. I think one of the greatest values uh, of this Leadership Institute program was, is and was the opportunity to meet and, and interact and, and talk with and get to know uh, other leaders in our community uh, leaders in our profession, leaders in the bar association, leaders within the judiciary, and um, and not just through a screen or not not just the the persona that uh, that they're required to put on for the public, but actually get to know them a little bit as people. And um, 
And so that's harder when uh, you're socially distanced either by having a mask across your face or having, uh, you know, you're doing it by video or other things. Um, so this year we're, we're doing our best uh, to organize things so that the program includes uh, as much face-to-face -face time as possible, even while social distancing and following other CDC and other uh, uh, protections. The, you know, you, you're asking about what, what can you expect if you're a, a student, um, a, a fellow that came in, you know, that our fellows come in and, and we have an orientation. Uh, that's part of getting to, to understand the program, but also getting to know each other, because I think one of the values of the program over the course of uh, about four, four or five months that this program goes on is that the fellows get to know each other. They're all relatively in the same area uh, in, in terms of um, the amount of time that they've been practicing law, somewhere between five and, and, and 15 years is our, our uh, criteria for selecting them, but uh, many of them um, you know, fall sort of right in the middle of that. So they're all roughly uh, the, the same generation, if you will. And within leadership going forward, as, as they develop as leaders and get involved, whether it's with the bar, other community programs and such, um, many times we've seen that uh, past leadership institute groups, they end up drawing from each other and bringing each other into uh, you know, programs and, and things that they're putting on because these are the, the friends and, and, uh, and you know, new uh, uh, leadership uh, resources that they've now developed. So, <laughs> so I, I think that's part of the value of it. Throughout the program then, they will go to different, uh, you know, about once uh, every two weeks, they will show up and, and uh, we were doing it at the, the Bar Association office and then at times at the judiciary, at um, uh, the legislature, and at different locations we've been able to set up to have the program held there and they meet with various uh, leaders within the community, whether they're political leaders, they're, you know, the, the, um, the judges and magistrates and, and, uh, and others, so. Well, it's, it sounds like the core point of the program is uh, they get to meet people who are recognized as leaders in the legal community. Am I right? They go through those four months and at the end of that time, they will have met and uh, heard from and uh, rubbed shoulders with and, and had uh, mask to mask discussions, if you will, uh, with ver <laughs> various leaders, um, you know, in the, in the, in the legal community. Uh, uh, am I right about that? I mean, that's the, that's the core, the core offering of the program, isn't it? That's exactly right. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, within the context of, of meeting them, it's not just a matter of, oh, here is so-and-so. Um, each of them, each of the, uh, uh, the, whether it's a panelist or the speakers and such that uh, you know, are kind enough to donate their time and be involved in this, you know, it, it, it's an off the record discussion of everything from um, what brought them into the leadership role that they're in to how they deal with and balance you know, uh, that role and that persona with their home life, with their, their spouse, their, their children, their, their, um, their other ambitions, um, you know, and it allows opportunities for each of the fellows to be asking questions of them. Um, and so I think that, that it, it, we get a lot of different perspective and an awful lot of opportunity to start considering, you know, each of them, the path to how they want uh, to develop themselves as future leaders, you know, of the bar and of the community. At the end of the day, it's personal. At the end of the day, uh, you want to be a leader, you have to have a worldview, you have to have a way of uh, relating to the community so the community has trust and confidence in you, people will follow you and so forth. And that means uh, that the leaders um, to, to whom they are exposed to this program will tell them things that you wouldn't normally find out from an attorney general of the state and how she deals with her kids. Uh, <laughs> or, or a uh, magistrate of the United States uh, District Court uh, exactly what his career pattern has been like, what motivates him, what motivated him to look for that job. Um, so that, you know, that's something that, that is elusive in the ordinary course, um, but you provide that. And uh, I thought it was interesting on, uh, on uh, it was a Friday, just a couple, just one business day ago, um, that uh, the sense of the group was they didn't want it recorded um, because they, they wanted it to be candid. 
And I told him, I said, okay, you made a choice. You want it to be, you want it not to be recorded. Therefore, you must make it candid. <laughs> you, all you guys are committed to making it candid. And I think it was candid. Can, can you summarize who appeared on the panels and, and what they had to offer to the members of the leadership class, which was uh, altogether about, what, 15 or so? Most of them were uh, in pres present uh, in the room at the Bar Association, distanced, of course, and, and, the, um, and the others were um, on, on Zoom elsewhere. And I was on Zoom, which I thought that, that was a challenge for everybody. <laughs> so anyway, can you talk about the panelists? Who were they and what, what were they offering in terms of their perspectives? Well, sure. Uh, you know, first of all, we had set up, uh, yeah, this is for the, the community leadership program. And so this is just one component um, of it, but for the community leadership program, we, we had, as in the past, had done it in forms of panels and we had two different panels um, and uh, divided uh, with uh, two members each. So the first panel had Catherine Matayoshi, who is a uh, you know, senior vice president of Hawaii Medical, uh, of HMSA, Hawaii Medical Service Association and Michael Broderick, who is the president and CEO of the YMCA of Honolulu. Um, who so used to be the administrator of the courts here in Hawaii and was a family court judge for some years. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then uh, the second panel had Claire Connors, who is our attorney general, and uh, we're seeing on TV, in fact, right after the program, she had to run off to get on a plane and then be on, uh, you know, be on the, the news and such. Uh, as she is uh, almost every night. Uh, so, and then uh, Magistrate Wes Porter, who's a U.S. District Magistrate Judge. So. Yeah, what an interesting crowd, and, and they were diverse in their approach to things and in their career patterns. Uh, I'm sure they all knew each other, uh, having rubbed shoulders at one time or another. But they were different in their own orientation and their own advice. And it's the advice that counted because they talked from the heart about, uh, you know, how. How, to, how they got to be where they are and what their leadership advice was. But I would like to spend some time with you about what that advice was and distill the kinds of lessons that they were talking about. I mean, for example, uh, I think they were all, all focused in some substantial part on credibility, um, on honesty, <clears throat> on um, um, being, um, you know, uh, developing credibility, guanxi, if you will, over, over a period of time so that um, people would treat them as leaders because um, they were known to be uh, honest. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I think that was, if there was a, a resounding theme that was echoed in the comments of each of these uh, you know, esteemed leaders, it was, you know, hey, Hawaii is too small a location for you uh, to be dishonest, for you to be uh, to promise something and not perform, uh, for for you to uh, treat people poorly, and good leaders are obviously not going to do that. Uh, but you know, one of the things that each of them said was, you know, they're very careful about, uh, you know living up to what they promised. I mean, you, you mentioned the other story of, uh, you know, that, that we've heard many times from David Louie, uh, you know, former uh, attorney general of the state that, uh, that he says that, hey, you know, when you get promised something, uh, you turn around and as soon as possible, I mean, within the same day, if you can do it, but you turn around and you, uh, um, and, and you act on it. Uh, so I, I, I think there are a lot of, um, you know, it, it's hard to, to, to uh, characterize, you know, what was important to each of them other than to say, well, you know, that was one. I think another one that was, uh, that each of them, you know, made reference to and such was the fact that uh, they had to find that balance in their life and in working with, with everyone because, you know, it required a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, uh, and so they had to find a way to balance uh, things, but, you um, you know, that uh, if for those that believe that, oh, if you're at the top or that you're, you, you're a leader, that, you know, you get to go home and everybody else does the work, that isn't it at all. I mean, all of them are putting in more work than, you know, you have to be willing, ready, and able to, to, to put in more effort uh, than anybody else if you want uh, to, to, to be a strong leader. And all of them are, are you know, demonstrate that every day. Uh, yeah. They're exceptionally high functioning and, and work very hard. 
Another touch point seems to me was the question of undertaking risk. Um, you know, it's like um, you, you have to take risks in order to be a leader. You have to make choices based on your best, um, your best analysis and uh, take the risk and, um, and, and fly into the mountain, as it were. That's your Sarian in Catch-22. Um, but but that was that was seemed to be a theme also about risk. Can you talk about it? Well, I can. I, I, I guess is it, you know one of the uh, you know one of the speakers was talking about the fact that uh, you know one of the things that you are put in that position to do is to make your best educated decisions, and uh, that not making a decision is uh, becomes a decision and, and oftentimes the wrong one. And so you need to use your best judgment. And that's something that, you know, many people are born with, they, they have struck, but also something that you can develop. But your judgment is extremely important. And that's part of why you've been put in the position to begin with and you need to get beyond being afraid or, or concerned, so concerned with things that you're unable to exercise that judgment, make decisions and move, uh, move things forward. Yeah, you know, it seemed to be a, a theme uh, with some, uh, with some mm, diverse uh, approach to it, and that, and that was career management. Of course, you have to manage uh, your, your professional time with your family. It's uh, really critical to, to keep balanced as a person. Um, but also, you know, on the one hand, you have to manage and plan your career the best you can. On the other hand, and I've, I felt there was a tension on this point. On the other hand, you have to let, let it flow. Let it go where it goes. You know, fate, fate will find you. <laughs> and I've heard a lot of, you know, uh, you know uh, big leaders uh, tell, tell me this. You have to just let it take you. And there was a kind of combination of views on that subject. Which one do I adhere to? Do I plan all the steps in my life? And, and some of these uh, panelists, you know, had many, many, many steps. Uh, Catherine Mariyoshi had been through like a dozen situations and each one she was stepping to a better thing. But it wasn't that she knew exactly where it would go. It just happened to her. So what was the tension and, and where do you come out on that, Craig? <laughs> well, you're exactly right. I think part of the message and maybe part of the message of the Leadership Institute uh, to, to the fellows is, you know, there's no one way of leadership. Um, and there's no one path to get there. Um, each of the leaders that, that were on the panel this last Friday, but many of the other leaders that are involved in our program, sort of illustrate the fact that they found their way into the leadership position that they had through a path that in many cases was serendipitous, that, uh, that wasn't necessarily planned. Uh, I think part of, part of the message that may not be said in that is that each time these leaders stepped into that position, whatever it was, they did everything they could to add value, to make uh, the organization uh, better than it was, to improve things, and, and to empower people with it. Um, and that's one of the messages, I mean, you ask how I come out on this, and, and, and it's interesting because, um, you know, for me, I, I'm certainly not in, in, in the kind of uh, leadership roles that, that they had, but I did have my opportunity to serve in the Bar Association and, and, and serve as a leader there. I continue to do things with the Bar Association. And I look at that as, as, as part of my efforts to give back to our, our profession, to our community, and, and, and I enjoy that. And I see you know, leadership and, and what I've learned from it um, and from many of these speakers uh, is that you know, a lot of leadership is, is learning how to empower others and, and, and to support others and allow them uh, to, you know, to become, you know, to, to exhibit their skills, to, 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 to be able to contribute to whatever the organization is and to be the best that they can be. And I, I was fortunate enough when I served with the Bar Association, the Board of Directors at the time I was president, you know, I had a, just an amazing group of people, um, all exceptionally bright, all very energetic. And we met before the year started, talked about what we wanted to do, made decisions, but we did it together. And when the decisions were made and we sat down and, uh, you know, after that went to our meetings each month, everything was marked against a, um, you know, we had set up a, a 
uh, you know, our plans and what we were going to accomplish. So everything was was a a, a uh, measuring stick against what we wanted to do that year. And at the end of the year, we were able to look back and say, look at what we've accomplished. I mean, these are the things we wanted to do. Check mark, check mark, check mark. These things got done, and also all these other things. Uh, but it was. In a sense, everyone walked away from that, I believe, and I certainly walked away from that feeling like that was a success. And it was a success because we did it together. And I didn't do it. It wasn't me doing it. It was all of us and different people took charge of different parts of it. And it, it, in that sense, I felt a, a great sense of uh, both accomplishment and just gratification for having had the opportunity to do that. Yeah, well, my, one of your uh, one of your characteristics is uh, modesty, <clears throat> and we'll forgive you for that. But you you represent to me, Craig, constancy and kindness. You're always at it. You never stop. You always have your hand on the you always have your hand on the tiller. Um, but I want to go to an article. There was an article in the Atlantic uh, a few days ago, and it uh, it was about how history will judge the people in in the uh, Trump administration. And, uh, and it was a really masterful article. Believe it or not, this article started talking about the leaders um, of the Communist Party in East, in East Germany in the 40s. Uh, extraordinary how different they were and how their, uh, their philosophies and orientations were so different. And then comparing you know, how leadership in America has worked and how leadership in the Trump administration has worked. And, and the bottom line of the article was history will judge all these people that we're reading about, um, and, and in, inherent in that statement is that it will not judge them kindly. Uh, I, I hope history gets to make its judgment soon, um, maybe November. But but anyway, the, the guy ended this article, and I really commend it to everyone listening. If anybody wants a link to this article, I will provide it. Um, the guy ended with a simple statement, is the one common denominator of leaders who history will judge kindly is decency, decency above all. And that is so important. If you're not decent, then, you know, what have you got? In any event, uh, we have only a minute left and I would like to talk about my, my pet issues. Uh, one is that um, these leaders and all lawyer leaders uh, have to be involved in the community more than before in the time of COVID. We have to re we have to re knit the sleeve, uh, the tattered sleeve of care. We have to form corporations, encourage business entrepreneurs, uh, help them, and the government has to do that too. And the government, of course, is controlled by leaders, many of whom are lawyers. Um, that's one thing. It's a duty, in my view, especially now in the time of COVID. And we talked about that Friday. And the other thing is the rule of law. It's very clear to any objective rational observer that the rule of law has been, has been undermined, seriously undermined, um, and maybe for a long time by the Trump administration. And lawyers are sworn to uphold the rule of law. It's not just their training, it's their oath of office. And I wonder if you could you know, comment about that as an element of this program and as an element of being a lawyer and being a leader as a lawyer these days. Well, I think it'd be hard to add much more to, to what you're saying there than, uh, you know, than to you know, just put my stamp of approval on it and agree with it. But uh, it absolutely, you know, I'll start with the rule of law. It, you know, as attorneys, um, you know, we are all not just subject to it. We we are we have taken an oath to uphold it, and uh, that in whatever capacity we're serving, whether we're representing clients, whether we're a judge, whether whether we are a uh, you know in the legislature uh, or another another political role, whether we're in an administration, as an attorney, we are to uphold the rule of law, and that you know that is an area that uh, as you've mentioned, I I think. Uh, now more than any time, certainly in my lifetime, uh, is is in danger, and I, I'm concerned about it. And I think that there are many that are concerned about it. We, as an attorneys, are also trained uh, as to um, as to what the rule of law involves and 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 what can be done to uh, you know to support it and to help. And so we should be stepping up. So our leaders through the Leadership Institute, but also our leaders who are already in place 
need to be taking the mantle and stepping that, that ball forward. Craig, it's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for doing that program. Thank you for creating it, this, this particular uh, you know, uh, term of it. Uh, thank you for sticking with it, even in a time of COVID. I'm sure there's a lot of challenges in putting it together and having people you know, do the things that are necessary to carry it forward. Uh, you are constant and you are kind and you are decent. So thanks very much for that. And, and thanks for being decent enough to come on the show at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Monday. We really appreciate oh, it. Pleasure. It was my pleasure. I can't, you know, so many people work so hard to put this together. And I, you know, I won't name them all here, but I, I, I will tell you that uh, you know, me taking credit for the Leadership Institute uh, is, uh, uh, puts me in an awkward position, all modesty aside, just given how much work um, you know, our, our bar association puts in all the people involved in that program. So I'm, I'm very grateful to them as well. And, and I, I'm happy to be a part of that team. Thank you. Craig Wagner, a member, an active member of the Hawaii State Bar Association. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Jay. Aloha.